Something really extraordinary happened around 12,800 to 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Now, I say ice age because the volume of ice on Earth was more than double what it is now. But half of that ice is gone. And in terms of geological time scales, it was like that. So it something was, melted all that ice in a very short period of time. You got it. What could it have been? And, and to me, it only comes down to two things. Possibly asteroid impacts or, or impacts, I'll say bolide impacts, because the term bolide can be anything that, it can be a rock, it can be a piece of a comet. It's something that comes out of the sky and, mm-hmm. and, and, and say, encounters, it hits the earth, right? Or the sun. Or the sun. Or the sun. Or a combination of the two. I don't know what else there would be. I've looked at things on a galactic level. I don't think that it would be on that level. I think the most likely explanation is that you had an impact. Right. However, there are new studies out that have been coming out in the last 20 years, ever since we've started with them. Um, once we've deployed solar observing satellites, we've seen something very interesting, that there seems to be a connection between hyperactivity on the sun and the infall of what's called the Kreutz sun grazers, which is a family of comets that nobody knew about until we deployed uh, solar sa- observing satellites, or at least I think maybe they were suspected, but we hadn't really observed them. Now we're seeing that constantly there's cometary masses falling into the sun, um, that, and they're generally small. However, as we may talk about here when we get into the Younger Dryas in a moment, um, there's evidence now that somewhere between 20 and, say, 25, 26,000 years ago, a really big comet came into the inner solar system, kind of got caught up in this ping-pong game between the Sun and Jupiter, right? And that comet began to undergo a hierarchical fragmentation, littering the inner solar system with the byproducts of its destruction, and that the Earth may have encountered that material on more than one occasion. A lot of it could have been swept into the sun, and what those Kreutz sun grazers are telling us is that uh, these hypervelocity impacts into the sun may be be triggering uh, solar storms, coronal mass ejections, and things. So a giant fireball got shot at the Earth. Maybe something like that. And interestingly, um, so what it might mean then is that you almost have this perfect storm. If you have the injection into the inner solar system of a very large mass of cosmic debris, if you want to call it that, some of it's going to hit the Earth. Some of it's going to hit the moon. Some of it's going to probably hit Mars. Most of it will end up... uh, probably being swept up by the sun, which is the, the biggest mass. Typically, when, when a comet, let's say, comes in and it's making this, this Jovian cir- circuit, Ju- Jupiterian circuit, mm-hmm. it's going out to the orbit of Jupiter, comes back in and circles around the sun. When it comes in and makes that close passage to the sun, that's called the perihelion, next, next to the sun, right? Typically, because the sun is such a strong gravitational force, Often what happens is cometary masses disintegrate mm-hmm. when they're at their perihelion point or short, shortly thereafter. So we, we saw something very similar. We were talking about it the other night over dinner, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 event of, of 1994. Right. Right? You had a single cometary mass that uh, passed by Jupiter in March of 1993. It passed so close to Jupiter that Jupiter's ultra-strong gravity force force of gra- its gravity field literally ripped one cometary nucleus into 21, if you want to call them, sub-nuclei. And then those 21 objects then formed a what was called the string of pearls. As, as they moved away from Jupiter, they began to spread out in a long line. They made a passage by the sun, and as they circled back out towards Jupiter, they arrived at Jupiter's orbit the same week that Jupiter was at that same position. So you had 21 impacts over one week of July 1994, 21 impacts into Jupiter. And any one of those impacts, uh, I think that from what I recall, those uh, objects, individual objects, were some of them were a kilometer and more in diameter. 
Now, if we had something a kilometer in diameter or more strike the Earth, it would pretty much throw our whole civilization into a serious tailspin. Um, it would have economic consequences that would take probably decades to, to work out. Uh, in the immediate area of the impact, nothing would remain. It would be completely annihilated. Um, and then the secondary consequences of an impact like that would have major uh, repercussions on on the rest of the world in wouldn't terms it, of climate and things. Wouldn't it be on the scale of like roughly dozens of hydrogen bombs? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In fact, we, we can actually look at some of that for comparison. There was There was an object... One of the main things that I really get into uh, studying and talking about is the that famous 1908 event over Siberia, the Tunguska. Mm -hmm. And that was an object, probably a byproduct of this very same comet that we're talking about here, um, that, is what, that has uh, produced what is now known as the Torrid Meteor Streams which is a family of these meteor streams that is still out there. Um, there's several known comets within that stream. There are several known asteroids. Um, Earth crosses that stream twice each year. It's called the Torrid Stream, Tor Torrid Meteor Stream. Mm -hmm. Earth crosses um, in late June, early July, and in late October, early November. And interestingly, that particular stream uh, – it peaks right around Halloween, so it's been called the Halloween meteors. Um, anyways, um, so the object that uh, didn't actually strike the ground. Most people would think, you know, an object coming in is going to strike the ground. And, in, in, it, and that all depends on the density of the object, really. If it's a – and think about the family of extraterrestrial uh, creatures that might – the Earth might encounter. You have a scale, a density scale. It starts at about the density of water, which is one gram per cubic centimeter, and that would be primarily a cometary mass that's mostly ice, mm -hmm. right? On the other end, you'd have an iron asteroid, and an iron asteroid would have roughly the density of a piece of cast iron. So imagine uh, that you've got, in one hand, a, a chunk of cast iron, and in the other hand, you've got a snowball. That's the two endpoints of the continuum, and then you've got the whole range of things in between. So you've got stony asteroids that are about right in the middle, right? Now, if, if you think about it, even the layperson, it makes sense that, say, an object as hard as a piece of cast iron is going to be able to penetrate through the atmosphere a lot more effectively and actually strike the ground right. than something that has the composition of a, of a snowball or the density of a snowball. Now, the Tunguska object was on the lower end of the spectrum, right? So it was not able to penetrate the full depth of the atmosphere, and it exploded about five miles up. Now, what you have to picture is that that five thing... Five miles. Five miles. So you have to picture is that thing's entering the atmosphere. What it's doing, it's moving so fast that the atmosphere doesn't have time really to move out of the way, and it compresses the atmosphere. And literally, the atmosphere becomes almost like a brick wall, at some point, very much like, you know, the atmosphere is a fluid. Now, have you ever done a belly flop? Well, oh, okay, yeah. right? Now, if you, if you do a belly flop, you know that even though it's water, it can still provide a, a tremendous amount of forceful resistance, mm -hmm. right? That's what the atmosphere does, right? So the object comes in early morning, June 30th, 1908. Now, interesting, remember I just said that the... Um, that the, the peak, one of the, the, what is called the summertime torrids, mm -hmm. is late June, early July. So in terms of the window of when the Earth is encountering debris from the torrid meteor stream, the Tunguska object was right in perfect timing, right? June 30th. Came in early in the morning. Now, And it ends in uh, around October, or around Halloween, you said? No, no, that's, it's almost like this. Imagine that you've got a racetrack. It's this elliptical racetrack. And all of this stuff is moving around the racetrack. And then here comes the Earth, crosses one side, and then it's out, free mm. of it, and then... Goes through again. Goes through again. Got it. Right. So in, in the summer, it's, Earth is crossing the stream when that material is coming from behind the sun. And see, one of the, th one of the consequences of that is that you don't really see the meteors, the torrid meteors, in the summertime. 
because you're looking in the direction of the sun, right? Right. If you want to see torrid meters, you have to watch in the fall because that's when they're coming from the direction of, of space. Most right. generally, the the direction of and they're of backlit the, by the sun, or they're lit by the sun, they're front lit by the sun. You got it, right? You got it. And so you're not looking at the sun; you're looking away from the sun, right? Got right? it. So that's the Halloween meters, if you want to call them. That. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah.